You know, there are many aspects or titles of Jesus listed in the book of Hebrews. For example, he's called the Son of Man, he's called the Apostle, the Forerunner, the Mediator, the Better Sacrifice, Pioneer and Perfecter of our Faith, and the Great Shepherd. We see for the original reader that God wanted to show these specific aspects of himself to them, to meet them where they individually were at their present situation. We see throughout this book that God speaks directly to the original reader in their time and in their difficult situation because the author wanted to show them that God was speaking now to them. Um, as we said before in the last lecture where we see several times in this book where the author uses an Old Testament quote and right before that he talks about how the Holy Spirit or that God is speaking directly to them now. Another example of that is in chapter 3 verse 7 where he says, therefore the Holy Spirit says, and then he quotes a, a quote from Psalms. And the reason that the author does this was to show them that, hey, you know what? God cares about you where you are right now. And God is speaking to you. Also, the author shows in chapter 4, verse 12 through 13, where the word of God is alive, that it penetrates, that it exposes, and that it's active. And the author starts the book out without even showing that God has spoken throughout history, that God spoke through the prophets, but God also spoke through the Son of God, that through Jesus came the new covenant, came the final revelation of who God is, and that God through this book is speaking directly to them. Because... The author wanted the original reader to get the perspective that God is with them, that God's not forgot them, because maybe as they're going through this persecution, which maybe was the Nero persecution, they're wondering, where is God? Does he care about us? Has he left us? You know, they're maybe being rejected by their friends and family, and they're having to hide, and it's difficult for them to go out in public, and, you know, where is God? Maybe they feel alone that God's left them. But the author showing them that, hey, God is actively speaking to you, that God is among you, and that God cares about you. You know, God comes again and again where humans are in our situations, our good times, our difficult times, and God speaks directly to us in whatever we're going through. Two of the most important titles of Jesus that listed in this book are number one, Jesus as the exalted Son of God, that he seated at the right hand of God, that he's finished his work, that we see Jesus is suffering, we see his humility in this book, but we also see him being glorified, that he has finished the work of salvation, that he's exalted. The second important title of Jesus in this book is Jesus is the High Priest. Hebrews is the only New Testament document that shows Jesus as the High Priest. That he's completed the work of salvation, he is the complete sacrifice on the cross, and he holds his office as High Priest permanently because he was raised from the dead. So let's look now into the book. Let's look in this lecture. We're going to be looking at Hebrews chapter 1 through 2. So first, in the first verses, we can see that Jesus has his role as the Son of God. And he is the superior revelation of God, and he's superior to angels. So let's read verses 1 and 2. And here you'll see there's a contrast between Jesus and the prophets. Long ago and many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed as heir of all things, through whom he has also created the world. So here you can see that the prophets, they were long ago. They were in the past. 
God spoke to them in many and various ways that it was partial revelation. It was the old covenant. Whereas through Jesus, God has spoken in the present that he is the final, the complete, the perfect, superior revelation, which is the new covenant. So God's ultimate and final word came through Jesus. He was the best. And so the author goes on in the next verses to describe more about who Jesus is as the Son of God. Let's go on and read verse 3 and 4. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the power of his word. After making perfection for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty. Majesty on high, having become much superior to angels, as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. So here we see that Jesus is the eternal, the pre existing Son through whom God created the world, who now sustains everything by his word. And so in these first four verses, we they're really compact with who Jesus is. So take time to think and meditate about why the author starts the book this way, of why he describes Jesus in such great depth. And think about what does this really mean? One important phrase though that we see introduced here and con continued throughout the book is the idea of Jesus sitting on the right hand of God. This, this is the idea of a place of honor, the act of sitting shows that Jesus completed or finished the sacrifice work. That purification was only done by the Son of God, but he sat down. It shows that it was complete. Nothing else needed to be done. Now, the rest of chapter 1 from verses 4 through 14, you can observe a contrast between angels and Jesus. The author shows this by using seven Old Testament quotes. Most of them are from the Psalms. And you can find out which uh, references they're from by looking at the cross-reference in your Bible. But it's important to realize that these quotes by this author are in the Greek Septuagint. So when you read it in our Old Testament, which is, which is translated from the Hebrew Old Testament, it will be look a little bit different so that's why so on the slide here you see the contrast that i've written and you can do it on your own as well but you see the angels that they are inferior that they are servants that they worship the sun they're created beings and their purpose was to serve god and the believers whereas jesus is superior his name is more excellent he's the sun he's the reflection of god he is forever and the exalted king. He's the creator. He's the same as God. He sits at the God's right hand and his enemies are under him. So he's the ruler. So, of course, th this contrast shows that Jesus is superior. But think more deeply. What does it show? What does it show more specifically? Just to give you some historical background on angels. In the Old Testament, uh, the Old Testament doesn't really give us so much detail about them, but we can see that they're involved in uh, Revelation and the redemptive history. Um, the Jewish history, they ended up adding names to a lot of the angels because we don't have so many names of, of them. The Bible only gives us a few names. And they thought, the Jews thought that Angels were the mediators between man and God. And so they believed that when Moses received the revelation or he received the old covenant, that it was actually angels as God's representatives who came down to Moses and gave it to Moses. So in the Jewish mindset, angels had a elevated position above man. So the original reader can see through what the author is saying here, that Jesus is superior to angels because angels are created beings that they are made to serve, where Jesus is the creator, that he is the ruler, that he is exalted. And so 
And God's final revelation, the new covenant, came through God's son, Jesus. And so he's superior to the Old Testament revelation, which the Jews thought came through angels. So that's why I think the author talks about angels in chapter 1 and in a bit in chapter 2. Okay, now let's read Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1 through 4. Therefore, we must pay close attention that we have heard, lest we drift away. For since the message declared by angels... So here again, the author is talking about how the Jewish expectation that the revelation of the Old Covenant came by angels to Moses. That's what he's talking about here. Since it was proved to be reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution. Here the author is talking about how through the Old Covenant, sin became defined. And it was valuable in the sense that sin could now be punished and receive retribution. Going on in verse 3, How can we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was first declared at first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, so through the apostles. While well, God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by the gift of the Holy Spirit, distribution according to His will. So, the author emphasizes here that the original reader are not to drift away. The, the picture here of drifting away is like a boat that should be anchored to the land, but it's not. It's just drifting out into the sea or to the ocean. And so he's telling them that if they do not hold fast to the salvation that they have, that they can also drift away. He also encourages them not to be tempted to lose heart, to have hopelessness here. And then in verse 3 and 4, he gives them a rhetorical question. And the idea of neglect here is like a careless attitude or a lack of concern or disregard for something. So there is no escape if they disregard, if they neglect their salvation. And the author gives them proof in these next verses of how they can know that their salvation is true. Because there's evidence that it first came through Jesus and then it was witnessed by the apostles and that they've seen evidence of it true through the miracles and through the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So how could they not know that God is with them, that God's among them, that this is the true revelation of God? And so they need to be careful and pay close attention to this salvation that they have in Jesus. Going on in verses 6 through 18, the author talks about the incarnation of Jesus and him living as a man and, and suffering as a man. Uh, verses 6 through 8 is a quote from Psalms 8, verse 4 through 6. And it talks about how man at creation in the garden, that man was above angels, but man fell because of sin. But the author shows that how Jesus is the perfect, Son of God. He became perfectly fulfilled, so he was above angels, and thus man will take that position. And then we come to verse 10. Let's read it. For it is fitting that he for whom and by all things exist, bring many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. So what does this mean? Well, the idea of founder here is the idea of the pioneer of salvation as one who goes before and leads the way. Perfection here is the idea of completion or fully caring out a purpose designed for. So suffering was necessary for before Jesus could become the complete pioneer of our salvation. That he didn't need to suffer for his own salvation, but he needed to suffer for others. He was the perfect son of God who became our perfect um, sacrifice by suffering and dying and thus making salvation available for man. Verses 14 through 18 talks about Jesus' human experience, that he became 
the champion of humans of how he through death dealt with the devil he dealt with the power of death and the fear of death and then in verse 17 talks about how is the first time the author mentions Jesus as the high priest so here think about the original reader that they are suffering they're experiencing persecution perhaps they're afraid of death of the possibility of being martyrs and the author wants to encourage them that God sees their situation that Jesus endured so much for them but also he overcame Satan and death and the the power of fear of death that they have nothing to fear that even if they became martyrs what greater thing could they do other than going directly to be with Jesus in heaven so they need to realize that they're not alone but Jesus is with them and they don't need to fear death because Jesus has already overcome it